Good morning, I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. And I would like to welcome you to our ninth annual John Hazen White Manufacturing Forum. And this forum is supported by John Hazen White, who also is a, a Brookings uh, trustee. Uh, John and his wife, Liz, and sons, uh, John and Ben, have been longtime supporters. So I wanna thank them for the financial gifts that they have provided. And that enables the independent work that our scholars do. So one of the big issues over the past few months has been the COVID pandemic. It has ravaged people's health and created serious economic issues for the country as well as the world. The manufacturing sector has been hit hard by questions in terms of consumer demand, supply chain issues and business practices. So today we wanna to look at how these challenges have been handled and what is the future trajectory of the sector. To help us with these issues, we put together a distinguished set of experts with considerable knowledge about manufacturing. John White is the Senior Vice President of OEM Sales at Taco Comfort Solutions, and he focuses on uh, sales and uh, customer relations. Ben White is Vice President of Corporate Development at Taco Comfort Solutions, and he deals with uh, issues related to company operations. David Cicilline is a congressman from Rhode Island. He was elected in 2006 and has risen to a leadership position within the House of Representatives. He serves as chair of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee and also chairs the House Antitrust Subcommittee. And he's been a leading advocate for the Make It in America agenda for strengthening US manufacturing. Susan Helper, is a Carleton Professor of Economics at Case Western uh, University. Uh, she writes extensively about uh, manufacturing and how it deals with uh, various challenges. And uh, for those of you who are watching, I would encourage you to submit questions. Uh, we will save uh, time in this forum to incorporate uh, your uh, questions into our discussion. Uh, you can uh, do that uh, via Twitter. Uh, we set up a hashtag uh, at, uh, uh, called a USMFG, uh, USMFG, so you can submit uh, questions and we will uh, get to as many of them as uh, possible. So I want to start with uh, John. So uh, COVID has had a dramatic impact on the economy and uh, business operations. And in the initial phase of the pandemic, how did your company respond? I know you uh, mainly work on the sales side. Uh, what problems or challenges did you encounter and how did you overcome them? Hi, Daryl. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so actually, uh, Daryl, uh, for, th for these couple questions, I think my brother and I are going to sort of tag team them because we both are on very different sides of the business and we both bring different perspectives. Um, and I think in true big brother fashion, I'm actually going to kick this one to Ben first so we can discuss the operational side of it. And then I can kind of tie that into how the sales uh, aspect worked as well. So, okay. Uh, sounds good. So uh, Ben, why don't you jump in? Morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you all and an honor to be on this panel. Um, so yeah, when, when COVID hit uh, back in uh, late February, early March, we started to see things. It, it definitely changed the way that we looked at our business um, overnight. Um, we had a team of, uh, of our executive leadership team uh, globally uh, that began meeting every morning at 7.30, kind of reviewing what happened the day before, uh, what, what are we going to be doing today and moving forward. And so the way that we operate, we had to really shift quickly. Um, and that included everything um, from uh, shifting to a work from home uh, schedule for all of our office workers or anybody that could work from home. Um, and, it, and it changed the way that we laid out our factory. So uh, we really had to look at our operations and figure out ways that we could uh, change our setup to allow for social distancing. Uh, we had a team that worked diligently to install uh, plexiglass dividers in between, uh, in between our employees on the, on the manufacturing floor. Um, and really, I mean, at the core of all of this was uh, two main goals. One was the safety and, and health and well-being of our employees. Uh, and the second really being making sure that we were maintaining a health, healthy level of business continuity. So as we worked through uh, this, uh, this challenge, we wanted to make sure that when we come out on the other end of this, you know, we have a thriving business that can continue to move forward. So um, with that, you know, we really uh, we work to uh, make sure that we were procuring the right per uh, personal protective equipment, uh, masks and sanitizers for our employees. Um, and uh, it, it really we had to look at, at all the aspects of our business, um, changing visitor policies. So making sure that, um, we, you know, it, it wasn't. Um, 
people coming in off the street for, for meetings and things like that. Um, we, uh, as I said, work from home uh, started kind of at the end of March um, and, and that kind of shifted globally. And I think one of the biggest things for us was the communication amongst our global teams and making sure that we were all uh, on the same page and how we address this. So um, our teams in Italy, um, in, in Switzerland, uh, Czech Republic, um, Vietnam, we were all coordinated in, 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 in how we address this uh, and making sure that our communication out to the employees was uh, was transparent and making sure that they had all the questions answered that they uh, that they had and making sure that they felt safe. So um, it, it's definitely changed the way that we uh, we operate on a daily basis, um, and I think we'll continue to uh, be you know, be a lens that we look through in terms of planning uh, new products in the future and the layout of our floor and, and of our offices and all those types of things. And I think. Um, you know, uh, as my brother John said, he can maybe touch on how it, uh, it affected kind of the external uh, side of the business and how we address things. Okay, John, you want to jump in on the sales side and uh, kind of the impact on customer relations? Certainly. Um, so on the sales side, you know, our immediate concern once we realized that, you know, this was a real thing and, and it was going to potentially and most certainly become more and more of a problem, more and more of an issue. Our, our first priority was to make sure that on the sales side, we had a product in the pipeline to supply the market. Uh, because very, very quickly when, when uh, this issue became up, um, you know, both Taco and also a lot of our customers, both on the, you know, in, in the trade, and so as far as plumbers, contractors, things like that, and also OEM customers, other manufacturers in the heating and cooling industry, um, were deemed essential manufacturers, which, mean, which mean that they, they, they were able to remain open. So very quickly we realized we have to make sure there's product out there in the pipeline to supply these people. They are essential, um, and without product, they can't do the, the job, which is essential. So uh, within the first, I would say, week, our first priority was to uh, contact all of our customers. Uh, and I'll, I'll point out that Taco has two kind of main uh, methods of distribution, if you will. Um, I, I guess you could say our primary one is, is through uh, buy sell reps all over the country. Uh, these reps buy product from Taco. They stock it on the shelves so they can supply their local markets very quickly. Um, we have reps in every single state. And the other me method of uh, distribution is through what we call OEM customers. OEM customers are other manufacturers uh, in our industry that buy Taco products then incorporate them into their finished goods. Uh, so for example, you might, uh, you might buy a boiler and that boiler will have a takeout pump on it. Um, so all these customers were deemed essential. Uh, and and so, we did, so we we did a pretty much a full audit of our warehouse to, to look at all open orders, for all of our customers and see what we already had built at that time on the shelf, ready to go. Didn't matter if it was supposed to ship in a week or in a month, we did a full audit of what we had on the shelf. Um, and then began going through our customer list one by one, contacting our customers and basically just saying, hey, look, you know, you, you know what's going on here. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty right now regarding you know, manufacturing, regarding you know, uh, you know, the ability to ship product, uh, things like that. So here's what we have for you. Some of it's early. You know, will you take it? Would you like to have it? So you have it on your shelf. And so there's no risk to you. Um, and I would say, especially on the OEM side, uh, the response was overwhelmingly positive. Um, the, actually, other manufacturers came to us and said, thank you very much for, for, you know, for taking the initiative, for offering. It's a true sign of partnership. Um, I think only in maybe one or two cases, people said, no, we're, we're going to gamble and keep, you know, keep it there at Takeo. So probably within the first uh, three, you know, three weeks of the, of the uh, pandemic you know, coming, becoming full blown, we had probably shipped about half a million dollars worth of product on the OEM side early to make sure that our customers had the things on the shelf they needed to, to continue supplying uh, essential products. So that was our primary, you know, first pr primary concern was to keep product in the pipeline. I think the, uh, the other concern was more of a longer term concern, but we began to think about it then, which is that, you know, now that we had begun to figure out ways to, to keep manufacturing in a safe and healthy way and protect our employees, uh, you know, understand that we wouldn't be manufacturing in, in what was uh, reduced capacity. Uh, the other challenge was to begin to look at the open orders going forward and figuring out prioritization. So if we only you know, manufacture, let's say, you know, 50% capacity, what do we make? What do we push out? Uh, so, so that challenge just involved a lot of communication, you know, daily or weekly phone calls with all of our major uh, customers, especially making sure that, you know, they knew you know, what our capacities were, um, and they could tell us, you know, what is priority, what is not. Uh, that was a challenge. It became almost a full-time job, um, but, but I think uh, we were able to handle it very, very well. And I have to give a major um, shout out to our supply chain and to our operations folks, buyer planners. Um, everybody worked together in a really, really wonderful way. Um, and I wouldn't call it seamless because there's a lot of challenges, but uh, I, think, I think our customers appreciated how we handled it. And uh, I think it was done the best way possible. 
Okay, hey, it's uh, great to have the uh, on the street uh, perspective in terms of what you actually dealt with and how you responded. So I want to bring uh, Congressman Cicilline into the uh, conversation. So I know you've had a longstanding uh, interest in uh, manufacturing and has uh, and have introduced uh, legislation to uh, promote it. Uh, so in terms of uh, the COVID pandemic, what were your worries about uh, manufacturing and what do you think the government should, should be doing to help out in this area? Uh, well, thank you again uh, for having me on this panel. And it's great to be with the next generation of manufacturers, these young Ben and John. And, uh, it's, I think, a sign that manufacturing is alive and well in America. Um, so I think one of the things that concerned me at the very outset of the outbreak of the pandemic was real concern about the supply chain and whether or not uh, we would have access to the equipment, the critical equipment, uh, ventilators and PPE and, and testing materials. And I think one of the things that was revealed during that early days of the pandemic was it was sort of a reminder to the American people why it matters that we have a strong manufacturing ecosystem, uh, particularly in the midst of a global health pandemic. And in particular, I was concerned that the president didn't invoke the Defense Production Act, which was really a powerful tool to ensure that manufacturers were producing the things we needed to respond to this crisis in a very direct way. And there was not federal coordination of the manufacturing of those materials and then the distribution. So we basically had every governor, every mayor kind of in a fight, you know, competing for these critical life-saving materials, driving up the cost and the kind of irrational distribution, not based on where there was an outbreak or there was need, but just based on who had the best contacts, who made the phone calls first. That it seemed to me revealed a total breakdown of what should have been an organized, rational distribution of critical goods being manufactured here in the United States. Uh, in response to that, I actually introduced a piece of legislation called the Global Pandemic Planning Act that would require the president to report to Congress on the status of planning and logistics for the delivery of critical supplies during a global health pandemic and uh, to describe whether he or she has invoked the Defense Production Act and how and why. So I think that's an immediate uh, tool that was really not properly used by the administration. Uh, but the impact on manufacturing has been, and John said, is significant in large part because manufacturing very often is, you know, people working in close proximity to each other, touching lots of products. And so it has all the, the conditions that would make the transmission of a highly contagious virus particularly dangerous. And so one of the things that I think we have to do and I've been advocating for is uh, to urge in the next piece of legislation that we do that we waive the cost share of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program, which is a really effective program uh, to support uh, small and uh, medium-sized manufacturers and to also double the funding for that program. So get rid of the cost share, double the funding so we can really supercharge uh, American manufacturing. And then the other thing I think we have to do, and I'm pleased the pres uh, Vice President is announcing his manufacturing plan, which includes uh, something I've worked on for a long time in Congress, and that is to really modernize the Buy America provisions and close the loopholes so that we're using the purchasing power of the federal government to actually support American manufacturers. Uh, even in this pandemic, the stories I've heard from local manufacturers where we're buying supplies like masks and uh, uh, protective equipment uh, overseas when, when manufacturers have been, had, had to stop manufacturing their own line of goods and could be manufacturing and are manufacturing critical medical supplies and we're not buying it from them. It's just crazy. So, you know, modernizing and updating the Buy America provisions to really support American manufacturing is the other thing I think we have to do. Okay. Uh, Susan, so you're an economist at a Case uh, Western Reserve uh, University, and you've written extensively on manufacturing uh, issues, and I know you uh, pay a lot of attention to the supply side issues that uh, the congressman uh, just uh, mentioned. Uh, so what do you see as the critical problems, and how can we address them? Well, it's a big question, and uh, I think it's a really exciting time for, for manufacturing. Um, I think the... Um, the contributions of, of people like uh, Takeo Comfort Solutions are now being recognized, I think, in a way that they, they weren't in America. Um, we've kind of seen the dangers of having, for example, 80% of our pharmaceutical active ingredients uh, made abroad, our masks and other forms of PPE made abroad. Um, and it's not to say that, uh, you know, 
everything needs to be made in the U.S. But I think what's happened is we've gotten an imbalance that led to some of the, the problems that we've seen. And so I think we need to sort of think about, you know, a building it back better, I guess is the new slogan. So not just getting through this current program, but can we, when we spend money to, to revive the economy, can we do it in a way that actually creates uh, a new infrastructure and, and helps us deal with future pandemics that I think, you know, it's just a question of uh, if uh, and, and, and uh, not, not a uh, win, not if. Um, and so I, I guess I've sort of seen kind of three things that we need to do. We need to sort of, you know, rebuild supply. And I think some of the stuff that uh, the Congressman mentioned and, and we'll talk about in the Biden plan begin to do that. Um, that there's a lot of market failures um, that mean that uh, we, we don't have a lot of manufacturing supply and capability in the US. A second issue that sometimes has been overlooked is demand. You can build up, you can subsidize people to do things, but now you need to make sure that there's a stable demand for those products. You know, demand for mass is up tenfold what happens when that demand falls. So I think some of this Buy America stuff is actually quite uh, interesting and important in, in making sure that companies that do build up capabilities actually have a long-term uh, ability to, to make a return on that investment. Um, and then third is doing things that make sure that taxpayer money is used wisely. And I think we've seen, you know, to the Congressman's interest in antitrust, you know, that some of the efforts, actually there was an effort to have a cheap, uh, robust ventilator supply and a small company was interested in doing it, Newport uh, Medical Systems. They then got bought by a large company that was not interested in having a competitor to their product. Um, so I think thinking about these kinds of things with demand, supply, and, and uh, you know, some conditions on, on support to make sure it's used, that those would be at least the elements of a plan. And I think we're starting to see what that, you know, the details get filled in. Okay, uh, terrific. So uh, Ben and John, I want to come back to uh, you. Uh, so going forward, uh, what challenges do you see and how has the pandemic affected uh, manufacturing in terms of both sales and uh, operations? Uh, uh, what are the changes that you've seen so far do you think are temporary changes and which ones do you think are permanently going to alter the uh, sector itself? That's a great question, Darrell. I think, you know, <clears throat> looking forward, uh, and, and I, you know, one of the things that we did early on was um, we really we split our entire workforce into two groups um, and uh, basically worked on a, a one week on one week off so that we had we had the ability to minimize the exposure of employees to each other. Uh, and that was really when things were picking up. That gave us the ability also to as we uh, reassessed our manufacturing layout um, it gave us the ability to do things like put in the, the you know the partitions and plexiglass, reevaluate our floor sh our shop floor layout so that we could um, we could ad adhere to social distancing uh, guidelines. I think moving forward, um, that will always be something that we think about uh, when we're looking at uh, you know if we're looking at a new product and what does that manufacturing uh, cell look like. I think these um, these types of uh, of measures will be a lens we need to look through. Moving forward, um, and and it certainly it drives uh, again towards that goal of, of our, our number one goal is, is having a, a healthy and safe workforce. Um, so I, I think that will always be something that we that we now take into consideration. Um, and and you know, looking, I think as we discussed a little bit earlier as well, the supply chain side of things, um, really kind of rethinking uh, things like inventory levels, uh, back you know, leveraging our relationship with us, our suppliers and our backup suppliers, and leaning on things like our long-lasting relationships with our, our core supply uh, supply supply base. Excuse me. Um, I think uh, these are all things that. Uh, up until this point where things we worked on, but um, this really uh, puts a magnifying glass on it, makes us uh, evaluate it. And I think it will change the way in which we um, approach situations like this moving forward. And, and John can maybe touch a little bit more on the, the, the uh, sales side of things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think <clears throat> as far as sales is concerned, you know, there, there've been some major shifts in how we, we, we do business. Um, and I think it's made us think about maybe how we'll, we'll do business going forward. I think probably the largest one, you know, coming from a sales perspective uh, is, is travel. The idea of travel and, and being present with a customer. Um, 
you know, anybody who's, who's done sales in any capacity will tell you, you know, the, the most important thing you can do is be in front of a customer to build that relationship, whether it's, you know, you know over a cup of coffee, over dinner, um, or just to have them have a face-to-face relationship so that you know, when or if something does go wrong, you have that rapport. It's, it's not just, uh, I'm your supplier, you're my customer, um, you know, boom, here you go. Um, I, I think for us, uh, what we found uh, very quickly is you know, in the very early stages of this, Takeo was very aggressive with our travel policy, you know, first of all, with international travel and then with air travel and then pretty much with all travel, um, which, 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 is, which was absolutely the smart thing to do. And the other piece of that is that, you know, your travel policy can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, if nobody wants to see you, if nobody wants to have you in their facility, then it doesn't really matter. Um, so I think it's really changed the way that uh, on the sales side that we service our customers. Uh, I think we've, we've made a really great use of, of Microsoft Teams. Um, and coming into this whole, this, this whole uh, pandemic, we had begun um, to incorporate Microsoft Teams for Takeo, for use at Takeo. Um, so this kind of just forced that on, on a fast track. Um, so I, I think it's going to change the way we, we, we think about uh, travel and, and personal visitations going forward. I think, I think, and I hope, to be quite frank, that, that they don't go away entirely because there is so much value to, to being at a customer and, also, and to see their manufacturing process and understand what their needs are. But uh, you know, the, the amount of interaction we can have over these video meetings has been really, really significant. And I think in, in some ways, actually, we're actually in touch with our customers more now uh, than we were before, because, you know, number one, we're in touch quite regularly just to see what their status of business is, you know, have things been affected? Are you actually open? Things like that. Um, but also just, it's, it's so easy to just hit the video call button and, and take 10 minutes and have a face-to-face. So I, I think, you know, maybe going forward, you know, maybe a customer where you, know, you typically would go see them four or five times a year, maybe you see them two times a year, but you make more use of this technology. I, th- I think that's probably a, a change that has happened and will probably manifest itself permanently going forward um, to some degree. Um, I think the, uh, the, other, the other thing that we've seen uh, from the very early stages here was, was an increased focus on forecasting and really understanding you know, what customers need, uh, you know, what their needs are and what our capabilities are. Because when, you, when, when, when everything's running 100% perfectly, it's no problem. You can, you, and you can you know, adjust things very easily, uh, maybe slip another order in, you know, no problem. Uh, when you all of a sudden have either reduced manufacturing capa- uh, capacity or challenges, you have to be very selective and you have to really know what you need and what needs to be made. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the sales team has been very, very aggressive about forecasting and working with their customers. And I think, you know, and going back to what Ben said about, you know, maybe rethinking inventory levels, things like that. I think the importance of forecasting um, and just increased communication with the customer um, regarding their needs is, is going to be uh, very, very important. Uh, I, think, I think that will, will not change. So, Congressman, earlier you mentioned some of the things that you would like to see the federal government undertake, but it also seems like the states are starting to get organized. We're starting to see regional partnerships. Uh, states are starting to coordinate uh, various uh, types of supply chain issues, uh, uh, procurement uh, practices, and so on. Uh, are there economies of scale among American states where you think cooperation and coordination would end up helping everybody? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that we know actually from a lot of good work that Brookings has done that our economies don't stop at the state lines and that they actually operate regionally. Uh, and so I think, you know, there are a number of programs, both the Manufacturing Extension Partnership and Manufacturing USA, which are really effective and good programs. And we ought to be thinking about allowing those to uh, be executed regionally. Um, one of the things that I've done is I've introduced uh, a piece of legislation to create the Southeastern New England Regional Commission, um, which will take in kind of the economies of Southeastern Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and a little bit of Connecticut, where there's a lot of common manufacturing opportunities and clusters, and be able to do uh, some planning and some strategic investment from the federal government to support manufacturing in that region. So that's a hard thing to do sometimes politically because we measure success in terms of jobs created, in terms of economic growth within state borders or city borders. And we have to sort of think about this work regionally. And I think these kinds of regional commissions is one way to do it. And, uh, you know, I think it's it's something that we really have to uh, create a template for really smart investments in kind of regional planning. But I think states are recognizing the commonality of their regional economies. And, uh, you know, we benefit from the maritime industry in southeastern Massachusetts as they do from the maritime industry and defense industries in Rhode Island. And so, uh, you know, I think the federal government has to facilitate that kind of 
thinking and planning and investment in the way we fund uh, investments in manufacturing as well. Well, thanks for the shout out of the Brookings work. I want to acknowledge the uh, great work uh, our Metro uh, colleagues have done at the state and local uh, level in uh, trying to promote uh, manufacturing. So uh, Susan, you have uh, mentioned a number of uh, different ideas in your writing, just in terms of the need to change purchasing uh, policies, uh, looking at local content requirements. Uh, you mentioned the possibility of uh, the U.S. developing a national investment uh, bank. Could you talk a little bit about these ideas and why you think they might be helpful? And if you could unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah, we, we've developed, I think, just over the last 20 years, a, um, a manufacturing system that was sort of developed on you and in, innovate here, produce there. And I think one of the things we're seeing at the variety of reasons that doesn't work, you, you don't uh, no longer get uh, ideas that you need to innovate if you're not producing, and you also uh, lack um, uh, access to materials in a pandemic, as we're, we're seeing right now. And so the, you know, sort of ask, well, why, what kinds of things make, uh, make it hard for small business to do things like uh, adopt Industry 4.0, which is a really cool way of uh, bringing information to bear on manufacturing and uh, automate and, and get real-time information. And a lot of it is we have a purchasing system that's set up to really uh, uh, minimize unit costs and not think about long-term capability. And I think this is an issue both in government and long-term in, in uh, private business. And so I think some of these uh, Buy America um, and domestic content rules will be important. But I also think that really thinking through, you know, what value does a product add? You know, maybe the piece price, uh, the unit cost is a little bit higher, but maybe it comes with, you know, the excellent customer service that that Takeo provides, that, and that can be documented and quantified. Um, and so I think thinking about that kind of thing is really important. Um, and, and I think then getting, we've mentioned the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. And one of the things I think is very important about that program, tiny as it is, um, is that it helps companies put together the pieces of a new and more innovative manufacturing system. It's not just you know worker training. It's not just new equipment. It's those two things together plus new ways of managing, you know, including things like um, taking advantage of worker knowledge on the shop floor to, you know, where do the sensors go? What can be automated? How do you automate it? And the MEP has done some of this work. I'd like to see them st stood up to do a bit more of this work and to then coordinate nationally and regionally supply chains. Um, so that's a little on the purchasing. Then to, to think about the finance side, um, one of the things I think that we've struggled with, you know, small business has struggled with they don't necessarily want to invest because they don't know, they have uh, such fierce competition. They get one chance. You make a mistake and um, you, you guess on the wrong material, you guess on the wrong piece of new equipment, you're out of business. And so it's easier to just let your equipment depreciate, uh, try to squeeze your workers a little harder. That's not a recipe for long-term success. Um, and so thinking about, you know, how do you get capital to these firms in a way that um, isn't so expensive? And how do you get venture capital and or, or, or new, new firms, new ideas? How do you help them get started? And it may be that we actually need to think about um, some government provision, not just of the money, but also of the expertise and the criteria for lending. So some really interesting ideas about a, a national investment bank that, that I think should be explored further. Okay, so we are in the middle of a presidential campaign. And actually, uh, just today, uh, candidate uh, Joe Biden released his plan to uh, promote uh, manufacturing. So I'd like to throw out a question and get uh, each of your uh, thoughts on this. Uh, so first on the Biden side, he his plan uh, proposes to spend $700 billion on American products and research. This would include a $400 billion uh, for a procurement initiative to encourage federal agencies to buy American products, and then another $300 billion uh, to support uh, research and development. Uh, 
Among the particular provisions would be uh, money for clean energy, a supply chain review that would ask uh, agencies to buy essential uh, supplies from uh, U.S. Uh, manufacturers. Uh, and he also wants to close some of the loopholes on Buy America requirements. President Trump also has uh, talked a lot about manufacturing during his uh, term of office. He's issued executive orders, for example, requiring uh, essential medical supplies to be purchased from American manufacturers. He's cut taxes. He's uh, it, uh, pushed uh, various types of uh, deregulation. So I'd like to get the thoughts of, uh, from each of you just uh, on each of those uh, perspectives of what you would like to see happen, kind of what are the, the strengths and uh, and or disadvantages of uh, each of the approaches that we're uh, seeing. Maybe Ben, we can uh, start with you. Yeah, so I, and, and unfortunately I haven't had a chance to review uh, the, the bill just put out, or the uh, plan that was just put out this morning, but I think, I mean, all of these initiatives are important, right? I, I think as we look at, um, as we look at clean energy supply chain reviews, uh, kind of maybe some loosening on the Buy America requirements, um, these things are all, I think, if done correctly, things that can help uh, American manufacturers and America, uh, manufacturers globally uh, be successful. And we need to constantly be, uh, be looking at these and, and you know, uh, I'm not an expert in, in any particular one of those areas, but working with our teams to really understand how do these affect us? Um, how can they, how can we, we work them to our advantage and, and work them in relationships with our supply chain team, with our suppliers, our customers, um, and making sure that we have a sustainable business model that will help us carry this forward uh, for another hundred years. Um, so I, I think um, in, in conjunction with each other, they can really, uh, they can be, if utilized correctly, helpful to uh, to our business model. Okay, John, your thoughts on these plans? It's a big question, Daryl. Uh, but uh, no, I, I think, and without going too deep in the weeds on, on either one, because um, you know, unfortunately, I've not had a chance to review in depth um, the, the most recent proposal. But but what I would say, and what I would like to see um, in general is you know. If we're going to pour a ton of money into American manufacturing and, and to protect it and to grow it, I think it's, I think there's a lot of good to that. Um, and if we're going to be adjusting policies, either you know domestically or, or how we interact with other countries as well, to protect and grow American manufacturing, I think it's a it's a good thing. Um, and obviously, you know, manufacturing to everybody in this panel and, and to our family especially is, is very very near and dear to our hearts. I think the one thing I'd like to see, no matter which direction we go, and no matter what happens in November going forward, I just, I just would hope that the people who are putting these policies into place. Um, and, and the people that are ultimately going to control where this money goes or where resources go um, have the ability and have the willingness to work with American manufacturers. And, and, and to, so if policies are created or, or, or if we're going to be allocating resources, uh, let's do that with the input of American manufacturers to make sure it's going to the right places, to make sure it's going where it's really, really needed. Um, and so that would be my you know, sort of very high level uh, answer to that is I think, I think wherever we end up going, um, I just, I'd like to go there with a lot of input from and manufacturers who need the help and who also can give you the best uh, best direction or, or at least the best uh, you know experience. I mean, I, to, to pull it back to a very very low level at Taco, we've always found that when we're you know, going to be changing manufacturing process, changing a policy, changing uh, you know how we do things, the first people we go to, um, particularly in the factory, are the people on the line who do the job every single day, um, who, who build that part uh, because they know more about that than you know well than we'll ever you know they'll forget more about it than we'll ever know. Uh, so I just hope that they that they bring in our experiences and, and, and our direct needs. So hope that was okay. Yes. No. Uh, thanks for that answer, uh, Congressman Cicilline. Your thoughts on the uh, Biden plan and either comparisons and or uh, contrast with the uh, Trump approach. Well, I mean, I think the Trump administration has, like so many areas, uh, talked a good game, but the conduct of the administration has actually significantly undermined American manufacturing and. So it began with the president's tariff war with the Chinese, uh, which seemed very sort of not strategic. And I know I heard from lots of manufacturers in Rhode Island who were significantly impacted by the imposition of tariffs. Uh, the Chinese seemed to have been in a better position to weather them. So I think having good trade policy that actually promotes American manufacturers and American business and American workers is key. Uh, I think the other thing is, uh, the president supported and the Republicans passed a uh, 
a tax bill at the beginning of last year that incentivized offshoring of manufacturing jobs. Uh, it provided benefits uh, and lower tax rates to corporate, uh, to economic activity outside of the United States. So I think a serious revision of our tax code. So we're actually incentivizing uh, jobs being created in America, which by the way is a bill I've introduced in the House and the Senate White House is introduced in the Senate, just the opposite of what the tax bill does and said, if we're gonna give a tax incentive, it ought to be to create jobs in America, not to create them outside of the United States. And uh, I think that the uh, investment in um, the air, the clusters that the Vice President Biden has named in his plans are important and emerging important sectors of our economy. And then finally, I think this notion of something I've worked on with Senator Murphy for the last couple of years is really uh, modernizing our Buy America provision. So, you know, it's, it's the case that virtually every agency of the federal government has figured out a way to work around these provisions for some exemption. And so they're using taxpayer money to buy goods and services uh, manufactured outside of the United States. That's lunacy. We ought to be using taxpayer money to support American jobs, American business, and American manufacturing. So I think those are four areas um, that I know Vice President Biden uh, is likely to do. I think President Trump's policy in terms of supporting American manufacturing has been a disaster. Hey, Susan, your thoughts on the Biden plan and the uh, things uh, Trump has uh, proposed? Yeah, I, I guess just to pick up on the tariffs, um, I guess unlike probably most economists, I'm not always opposed to tariffs, uh, but I think the way they were implemented uh, was really you know sudden, haphazard, and didn't really take into account how modern supply chains are organized, where a lot of American manufacturers really depend on inputs from China. And you know, there's some issues with that going forward long term that a lot of the reason these prices are cheap is that um, uh, China is subsidizing things, they're exploiting their workers, exploiting the environment, but you don't change that overnight by just uh, tripling the price. And so one of the things I think is interesting about the, the Biden plan is a, an effort to kind of coordinate and complement that, you know, when you need, when you're trying to redo a whole system, you need to think about you know, these, these different sides, the supply side, the demand side. So I think, you know, at least the broad outlines of the plan, you know, there's a demand side plan piece from the government, this government procurement. And then there's a the supply side piece. Let's build innovation. This is the long-term place where the U.S. needs to compete is innovation, not just in products, but also in process. Um, and uh, so I think that there's a promise there that uh, of kind of coordinated thought through policy that, that we haven't seen from the Trump administration. Hey, we're starting to get uh, questions from the uh, audience. So I'd uh, like to get your uh, thoughts on some of those items. So uh, we have a question from a law professor who lives in Egypt. Uh, El Siad Abdu Kalag, and he wants to know what can manufacturers do to protect worker health at a time of uh, COVID. Ben, you want to start yeah, with? Absolutely, yeah, it's a great question, and I think uh, at the forefront of that is something that we've tried to be very uh, intentional about through this whole uh, experience, which is communication and being transparent. Um, I think making sure that. Uh, you know, all of our employees are aware of what's going on uh, daily, um, making sure they're getting regular updates and that we are, um, we are upfront and, 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 and clear with everybody about uh, the uh, measures that we're taking, the changes that we're making, whether it be uh, from a um, policy standpoint internally or uh, like we were talking about earlier, the shop floor layout. I think making sure that that, that our employees, that employees of any business are uh, are communicated to on a regular basis, that they understand what's going on, that they have the ability to ask questions and express their um, their concerns. Because a lot of times, as we found as we went through this, starts may lead to things that we hadn't thought of that we can where we can make improvements. Um, and and like I said uh, at the very beginning of this, the I think the number one goal, and many employers would probably say this. Uh, is is to have employees who feel safe, who are healthy, uh, and that uh, come to work every day in a, in a place where uh, the employer can support that type of environment. So um, as we've gone through all of this, I, I, again, I think just uh, the, the number one thing is clear communication. And, uh, and I think sometimes, you know, when we first started um, addressing some of the, the things that were, that were coming to light with COVID, uh, 
you know, we, we jumped on things in ways that maybe some people would say were, um, were being, you know, overreacting. Uh, but as we moved through, um, and, and John, you know, mentioned earlier, some of the travel restrictions we put in place and uh, things like that, you know, I'd rather overreact now and protect our employees uh, and see what happens as we go forward than have to deal with something um, further down the line because we didn't take something seriously. So I think really being aware of what's going on globally and how we can implement these measures internally. But that line of communication, I think, is, is really, uh, and transparency is really crucial. John, uh, your thoughts on how to protect uh, workers? And I might also know you have uh, factories both in Italy and Vietnam. So I would also be interested in that international angle. Absolutely. Well, I think... <clears throat> As far as how to protect the health of workers and, and moving forward, I think you know I, I think most companies you know, from the last several months have put into place you know several policies and, and several uh, you know adjustments to how they do things in order to at the very least you know protect their employees up to that point. And whether that's doing A and B groups, whether that's putting up plexiglass shields between manufacturing stations, rotating people in and out of the office, things like that. I think what we can do to protect employee health going forward, uh, first of all, would be to remain you know tenacious in how we. Uh, pursue these policies and, and keep them in place. Uh, I think there's kind of a tendency at this point, I think everybody's hitting a, I guess we call a point of burnout almost. It's, it's been, what, uh, five, six months since it all kind of began. And, and it's, it's been a very stressful time. And, and all day on the news, it's COVID, COVID, COVID. Uh, and then you see a, a weekend like last weekend where you see pictures of the 4th of July in different places around the country where people are packed together like sardines, not wearing masks. People are sort of, sort of I don't want to say over it, it's the wrong word, but I think it's, it's the tendency to say, okay, it's been going on this long, uh, you know, what, what can you do? I think the most important thing is to remain tenacious in these policies, uh, you know, be that, you know, restrict, continuing to restrict travel, continuing to maintain social distancing within the manufacturing uh, environment if possible. So, so just, I would say ultimately stick with it would be the, big, the biggest thing. You know, don't, don't, don't let yourself get sloppy and slip because people are you know, tired of wearing masks or tired of having to put on gloves, things like that. Stick with it uh, would, be, would be my primary uh, advice on that one. And Congressman, your views on how to protect uh, worker health in the manufacturing area? Well, I, th I think first and foremost uh, is to follow the guidance of public health experts. I think, you know, we have agencies charged with that responsibility, particularly the CDC. Uh, I think this is a moment to reinforce that we need to follow the science and follow the medical experts on what are the appropriate distances and what are the appropriate protections. Uh, we included in the HEROES Act a, a provision that would require OSHA to require that uh, businesses develop a plan specific to their business to keep their employees safe, applying the standards, the public health standards. I think just requiring businesses to think intentionally about the application of these uh, safety standards. I mean, TACO is a great example. They did that, of course, on their own, but there are businesses who are not doing that. Uh, so I think... Um, just following the science, following the public health directives and being sure, you know, the government I think has to play a role in helping businesses and schools and other critical places um, do the things that are necessary to make their facilities safe. This is not cheap. You know, when you have to cut down the class size to 25% of the students in the class so they can be safely distant and make sure everyone has a mask or if you have to install plexiglass and all kinds of things out of business, those cost money, and so making sure that we have resources available, either grants or loans at zero interest to uh, or direct assistance to public institutions to help them do what we know is necessary to keep their employees safe is critical. Because my experience is that most businesses want to do the right thing. They care about their employees, but the, the economics of it, and particularly in a severe economic downturn are challenging and we, the federal government, I think has to be prepared to play a role to provide those resources. Susan, your thoughts on what we need to do to protect worker health. Yeah, one thing I might add, an idea is that they uh, require companies at least of a certain size to, to at least think about having elected worker health and safety committees. Um, that this is a, a way of getting in an organized way some worker voice about you know ideas of uh, 
you know, things you hadn't thought of, unsafe conditions, or sometimes there's conflicting incentives where the owners of the business want safe practices, but they haven't realized they've created some production pressure in a you know corner of the plant and people are being required to work too closely, but no individual really feels like they can speak up. So I think this kind of an organized body um, and you could make it uh, a condition or, you know, say in a, in a few months or something in order to get this uh, money that the congressman is talking about to help with the, the health and safety that you have to have some of these things. And maybe in a small company, it doesn't make sense. But I think a bigger company, it could really uh, provide some really um, avenue for worker voice. It's useful just to both the companies and also to the workers. Great idea. Uh, we have another question from Eleanor Wolf of the Hewlett Heritage Society. She wants to know, how will the pandemic affect the move to a green economy in the manufacturing area? I, I can jump in on that one a little bit. Okay, um, Susan, go ahead. I mean, I think this is, a you know, another example of a place where we have a chance to build things back better. Um, in a couple ways. So one is, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a, I think, chance to plan while people are at home. We can sort of think about what, what can we do differently. There uh, is a direct um, correlation between air quality and the severity of the COVID experience for people. So I think it gives us, you know, short term reasons why we want to clean up the air. Um, and then I think, you know, as we think about a stimulus, uh, what are we going to, how are we going to return, you know, and get people back to work? We have 11% unemployment now, generally, and 9% in manufacturing. I think there's a, an appetite to spend government money. And if we can spend it in a way that is also an investment in a green future, I think that would be a, a, a really great way of, of spending that money. Yeah, if I could just jump in, I, I agree. And, and that's reflected in the infrastructure bill. Uh, which we just uh, considered in the House, uh, which has a major investment in renewable energies and resiliency, and, and it's reflected in Vice President Biden's manufacturing plan. Uh, so this is an opportunity to create good paying jobs in the green economy. At the same time, we're responding to the very serious national security threats of climate change, the very serious public health threats of climate change. And if, if there's one silver lining of COVID, I hope it's that people now have renewed our belief in science and the danger of not responding to real threats, whether they be a COVID, be a global health pandemic or climate. And I think there is growing awareness in this country that this is both a responsibility and an extraordinary opportunity to, uh, to really build an economic recovery around uh, a green economy. And, uh, resilient and sustainable infrastructure and reducing carbon emissions and preserving our planet. Okay, uh, Lydia O'Neill, who's a reporter for Bloomberg Tax, wants to know, what are the biggest tax policy priorities in order to help manufacturing? Any of you who want to jump in? You should probably ask the manufacturers. I mean, I have my own view of what I think would be useful from a legislative perspective, but Ben or John may have a better idea of what would be helpful to their own business. I would say if you're going to start and lay out what your thoughts are, I'll hop in on the other side of that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, the investment tax credit is one that is always raised by manufacturers. But I think in terms of if we, you know, I mentioned it earlier in the panel, I think we have to totally reverse the existing tax structure. Um, you know, manufacturers are like other businesses. They're, they're designed to make a profit and to maximize profits. And so to the extent that we have a tax code that incentivizes them to offshore their economic activity and enjoy a lower tax rate, we have a tax code that's creating an incentive for creating good manufacturing jobs outside of the United States. So to me, this kind of most important thing we could do is reverse that immediately and create the same kind of incentive uh, in our tax code to create good manufacturing jobs within the territorial borders of the United States. And then I think we have to 
um, I, I hear from manufacturers a lot about the necessity of training a skilled workforce, that they have jobs that are available, but they continue to have difficulty filling those jobs because folks don't have the skills. You know, manufacturing is changing quickly and people are willing to kind of up, you know, uh, improve their skills, but they need resources to do it. And so I think continuing to invest in really good job training and skill development so that folks can, you know, change their skill set as things change in manufacturing are two of the areas that I think are important priorities. Susan, you want to jump in? Yeah, I guess I I tend I, I definitely think we should reverse incentives for offshoring that are built into the tax code. But as far as other kinds of you know new tax breaks, I would rather take that dollar and use it to build uh, government capability because I think what we need is this uh, coordinated. Um, change. I mean, the, the congressman mentioned the need for training. And so sometimes people say, oh, there should be a tax break for having apprentices. And I don't think that's well situated, well designed for the way costs really get incurred. When you set up an apprenticeship program, the costs are all up front. Um, and you, know, you have to get things certified, you have to design a program. I and then, and so a per employee tax break that then continues, you know, year after year when you're not really incurring very many costs, it, it just is not well designed. And so I think it'd be better to take that money and use it to really provide companies assistance in those upfront costs. So let's, you know, have a government, either state or federal office that really helps figure out what are these apprenticeship, apprenticeable occupations? Where are the courses? So I think, um, thinking about government services rather than more tax base uh, tax breaks is is a good direction to go. Carol, can I just add one thing to that? Because I think Susan, uh, you know, there's been a bill introduced uh, for a number of years by my wonderful colleague Tim Ryan to, that calls for the development of a national manufacturing strategy. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of that. I think that uh, is something that you know Susan's comments would really benefit from that is, you know, rather than sort of just reacting to an industry or an incident, actually develop a thoughtful, comprehensive national manufacturing strategy that says, if we're serious about, you know, growing American manufacturing, here are the ways we need to do it, both with our tax code, with the budget that we pass, with the way we think about workforce training, a fully integrated plan. And uh, I hope when we have a you know, a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate and Democratic president, that will become law. And then we can really have some, you know, not only someone leading this effort on behalf of our country, but actually a plan where there's real consensus that has been developed across the sectors that this is how we grow American manufacturing. So John, there, your thoughts on uh, tax uh, policy uh, priorities? Yeah, I, I would say I would circle back to uh, the Congressman's first point, actually, I think I think one priority would absolutely certainly be uh, some sort of investment tax credit, um, because re reinvesting into a business, particularly a manufacturer, a manufacturing business, is, is, is incredibly important. Um, you know, we, we go up against competitors who are who are much much larger than us, um, so we're constantly trying to figure out ways to uh, to optimize our manufacturing process, um, to protect, potentially upgrade our technology, um, and keep ourselves you know very very competitive. So the other the other piece of that actually ties back into what Congressman Cicilline was saying regarding you know, investing in our in our workforce. Uh, because as we invest in machinery and processes and th things like that, you, you need people to run those machines and, and know how to do these things. Um, and, and, you know, my dad has said it on this panel a hundred times, you know, the best thing, you know, Tago's best asset, the best thing we have is our people. Um, and so to invest in those people and to invest in, in training classes for them and courses, you know, if they're there and, and they, and they want to learn how to uh, you know, run, run a CNC machine, or if they want to learn, learn anything from uh, you know, a business degree to, English as a second language to, to anything to invest in our workforce and to keep them, you know, to keep them happy and knowledgeable um, and, and at the top of their game essentially is the most important thing we can do. Um, so if there's some way to sort of incentivize investment you know, back into the company and as a and, and to incentivize ownership particularly um, to take you know, to take um, profits and things, and things like that as opposed to just pocketing them to put them back into the company uh, to help grow it and protect it, I think that's I think that's paramount. Okay, we have a question from Buckley Brinkman. He wants to know, what will be the biggest permanent changes to U.S. manufacturing resulting from COVID-19? Uh, 
You, know, I'll yeah, jump in. you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll jump in a little bit. It's interesting. I think um, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot, um, this experience going through this the last you know four, five, six months has caused us to really take a look in the mirror at some of the, the business practices that we, uh, that we have. So um, one of the things, for example, that we were uh, that we switched to almost overnight, like I mentioned earlier, was work from home for for those who could, and um, that that was a change for us because one of the one of the biggest uh, I would say the biggest benefits to to take on one of the biggest uh, one of the best things about it is our culture, and we um, you know it's it's something that I think makes people uh, want to stay for a long time. It's, it's got a great supportive environment, um, you know, switching overnight to to really. Um, a big portion of the business working from home has changed the way. I, th I think that will change the way we look at, um, you know, all of a sudden not necessarily having to have employees. Um, if we're hiring somebody for a certain position, if they're, they specialize in that and they don't live in Rhode Island or they don't live in Massachusetts or Connecticut, kind of opening up the, um, you know, broadening the thought process of, okay, if they live in Wisconsin, that's not a problem. We have the capability, the technology, um, and, and being able to think about that, um, so I, I think kind of the, the way that we have looked at um, at that side of it will, will definitely change moving forward. And John, I don't know if you want to touch on that as well. So Ben, your, your answer was awesome, but I have to admit my, my, my audio cut out for a second halfway through the question. So, so I'm not sure exactly what the question was. I apologize. Yeah, so John, the question was, what's the biggest permanent change uh, to U.S. manufacturing resulting from COVID-19? So, you know, we've talked about kind of operational uh, changes, uh, business practices, and so on. What do you think will be the, the biggest permanent changes? So as far as permanent changes, I, I would say there's probably a couple. I, I think the biggest one that I don't see going away anytime soon would be the work from home issue that Ben, that ben just described. I and mean, we found that people can do their job just as well, if sometimes not better, uh, from home. So I don't know that we'll ever go to 100% work from home, but I think going forward, um, that practice will be probably much more uh, acceptable in, in companies or, or, or more uh, you know, companies will, will, will be more open to it in situations where before they may not have been. So I think that's probably one of the, the largest changes. Uh, I think it's also changed, uh, and this is coming from a takeout perspective, but I think it would apply to other manufacturers, um, would be it'll, it'll change the way we view trade shows and things like that. Uh, because, you know, up until even up until January, we had our largest trade show of the, of the year a annually uh, in Orlando, and you have some 50,000 people crammed into to one building and it's, it's, it's a big event, but I, I just don't know if going forward, we're gonna look at those events the same. I think people will really, really have to reevaluate, you know, the importance of, of trade shows or how they approach them. And that, that might sound like a, a small thing, but I mean, in our industry, especially, it's a, it's a major, uh, major, major issue. I think the last thing would be, uh, it's probably gonna change the way we approach training. Uh, for TACO especially, training is an incredibly, incredibly important thing. We have a staff of, I wanna say four or five full-time trainers. Uh, located all throughout, the, all throughout the country who do trainings you know, on site with different wholesalers and customers and things like that. And they do virtual trainings as well. Uh, we, we obviously had to switch to entirely virtual trainings over the last six months. Um, and in six months, uh, we have between uh, you know, our Takeo Tuesdays, which happen on Tuesdays, Takeo After Dark trainings, which are on Wednesday evenings, um, and then you know, different custom trainings for, for, for different customers. We, we've reached out and touched over 14,000 uh, customers, uh, which is you know, for, for a six month period, unheard of. Um, so I, th I think it's, it's going to change the way we do training and, and perhaps shift from a, a focus on in-person um, trainings to a, to a much more broad electronic uh, medium. So, so once, once again, that's very, very takeo specific, but I think that would, in the industry at least, uh, translate fairly, fairly across the board. Susan, what do you think will be the uh, largest permanent changes resulting from COVID for manufacturing? Well, first of all, shout out to, to Buckley, who uh, runs uh, really involved in the MEP in uh, Wisconsin, does really great work there. Um, and I think he's going to have his hands full because I think one of the big changes, I hope, is a renewed appreciation for uh, U.S. manufacturing. I think this uh, renewed appreciation uh, of the importance of risk and hidden costs of the supply chain system that we've developed um, will, will, will lead to that. And so I think then also, I think a, a maybe a desire to have more robustness, not just in supply chains, uh, but even in the domestic operations. So I, I was actually thinking when, when John was talking about training, thinking about training of workforce, that people are now doing jobs that they, they didn't do before. Um, 
and uh, you know, can you actually in Ohio, there's a, a company that uh, wants to kind of start off making masks and then but intentionally invest in equipment that they can make auto parts and then shift over if there's a need for mass. Um, so I think that kind of, of robustness um, you know, and what we need is um, you know, financial models that help people understand you know, how much is that real option valued. Um, so an idea I, I've, I've had, I guess, is to, to help with that. I think you know, we have these Manufacturing USA institutes that are organized around technologies. You know, we have an additive manufacturing one. We have a low power electronics one. What about one for kind of modern management practice? Uh, so we could think about, you know, how do you take into account risk in your business? Um, how do you uh, involve your workers and seek input from workers? What kinds of changes in reporting relationships do you need when you put in Industry 4.0? Um, so that you know, rather than, you know, as a complement to these technically focused uh, Manufacturing USA institutes, have a management focused one um, that I think could could help with you know really making some of these lessons uh, uh, long lived. So, Congressman, we have a question, uh, which I think uh, is appropriate for you from Dankoff. He, he wants to know kind of, you know, COVID obviously revealed a lot of problems, a lot of holes in uh, U.S. manufacturing supply chains. He wants to know how can we make our supply chains more resilient in the future? And if you could unmute. Sorry about that. Uh, great question. I think actually, um, that, that's one of the things that I hope is a permanent change that there is uh, kind of an intentional effort and a kind of deeper understanding of the critical nature of a supply chain, particularly for essential medical supplies in a health pandemic and, and obviously in a lot of other areas. Um, we actually address this issue very specifically in the HEROES Act um, in which we included very specific uh, actions to try to uh, protect the supply chain associated with COVID uh, and the, the pandemic uh, broadly. Uh, it provided that the Food and Drug Administration have enforcement authority if a drug maker doesn't provide required notifications on supply chain interruptions or doesn't develop required risk management plans. It permits the FDA to destroy imported counterfeit devices. It authorizes $100 million to designate National Centers of Excellence in Continuous Pharmaceutical Manufacturing. It directs the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority to award contracts to enhance the manufacturing capacity of a COVID-19 vaccine. And it required the president to appoint a medical supplies response coordinator. So I think the HEROES Act has very specific um, uh, actions that can be taken to help protect the supply chain. But all the things we've discussed on this panel today about making sure we're protecting manufacturers, make sure we're creating uh, opportunities. If there is a, you know, a, a, a critical product that is not currently available in the United States, what do we need to do to help a manufacturer start that line of manufacturing? Reagents for, for testing is an example where most of that comes up from outside the United States. So figuring out what is missing in terms of American manufacturing, what do we currently not make? What are the impediments to that? And how do we help facilitate a, a robust competitive manufacturing sector on that item as well? So I think you know, those steps that we included in the, the HEROES Act, I think are some important first steps to try to really uh, focus attention on the supply chain. Uh, but all the things we've spoken about to encourage and grow American manufacturing obviously are also going to relate to the supply chain. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, ben, uh, your thoughts on how to make the supply chain more resilient? And I don't know if you've already uh, made uh, changes in your business practices in uh, that regard. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, John, I think touched on it earlier uh, today. As it pertains to our business, I think one of the crucial things in looking at our supply chain um, is the forecasting side of things and really being able to look out, you know, a lot of the components that we um, procure from all over the world have very long lead times. Uh, so looking at this, being able to uh, look at, um, uh, you know, dual, dual sourcing um, and, and, and looking at that geographically um, all over the world, um, I think 
also, you know, being able to learning how to build in flexibility um, because as things like this situation occur, um, it's not just thinking about the orders that we will place in the future. It's how it will impact what we are looking at current day and, and, and how does that affect uh, our, our pipeline. So I think um, looking at our, our global supply base uh, and, and we have a phenomenal team um, globally working on uh, on this side of things and really rethinking um, you know that that flexibility side of things, um, d diversifying and, and dual sourcing, uh, and and the importance of the relationships with those suppliers. So in times like these, you're able to work through situations together um, is going to be, I think, really crucial. Okay, Susan, I know you've written a lot about supply ch uh, supply chain uh, issues. So how do you think we can make them more resilient? These are a lot of great ideas. Um, I I think. Um, maybe one overarching thing and one uh, tiny thing. So I think overarching is to think about more supply chain collaboration. Um, and a, a real example of this is in the 90s, uh, Toyota you know, had a sole source for a, a small brake part and this company had a fire. You think disaster. Well, what happened? There are suppliers from all over the world uh, and all over Japan, even suppliers who made things that were totally different pitched in to help you know get Toyota back on its feet and so uh, Toyota lost like a day of production due to this massive fire um, and so I think that kind of you know loyalty collaboration communication and also flexible equipment is really important and so I think that that comes back and it's it's different than what's taught in purchasing uh, classes. I used to teach purchasing actually early in my career and I still teach in a school of management and so I think one of the things that we need to do as management professors because I think this is not necessarily something that that is a, a role just for government you actually offer better sh shareholder value if your ship supply chain is more resilient um, so I think that's my, my big message is collaboration and, and figuring out how to value collaboration how to because it's costly um, so that's the big thing. And then the smaller thing is I, th I think there's some ways that U.S. government practice, you know, really does encourage offshoring. And just a micro example of this is FDA inspections are much more onerous for U.S. facilities than they are for foreign facilities. For foreign facilities, they are announced in advance. Um, and and way less uh, detailed and frequent. And so that policy obviously needs to change. John has a question about the workforce needs, and it's kind of in the context of reshoring jobs, you know, bringing manufacturing uh, jobs back to uh, the United States. And so he wants to know, basically, if we actually do bring jobs back, are we going to have the workforce and particularly the, the high skilled workforce necessary to actually do the work? Can I, can I just top in at kind of a high level on that, if you don't mind, um, and, and just say this, <clears throat> I, th I think we will, I think we will have the workforce. And if, if the people out there that want to fill those jobs and, and, and want to come work in manufacturing, don't have those skills immediately, train them. That's, that's, that, 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 that's the only answer to that. If, if people want to come and, and fill those jobs and they're serious about wanting to work in manufacturing and, and uh, to, so that's the way we look at it, Takeo. If you want to come here and work, and work with us, and, and there's a skill that you need to do that job well, and you're serious about it, and you don't have that skill, we'll do everything we can to train you and give you the tools you need to work for us, to work with us, and to succeed. So I mean, maybe that's a, not the answer that anybody's looking for, but I think if uh, people want to come do the jobs and take it seriously, and they don't have the skills, train them. Congressman, your thoughts on that? I know you've worked hard on workforce training issues. Yeah, I think this remains a important challenge. I think we've made significant progress and I'm particularly proud of the work that's been done in Rhode Island uh, where our governor really engaged the business community uh, in developing workforce training. You know, it used to be basically workforce training plant programs kind of designed what they imagined people needed and then they trained people and then they'd go look for jobs which didn't make a lot of sense. What Governor Raimondo has done, which I think is really a national model, is she's brought the employers in and said, what do you actually need in order to hire folks? And then she's trained these people with basically a commitment that once they get that training, they'll have a job. It's called Real Jobs Rhode Island. It's been a fantastic success. 
So I think uh, what we've learned is when good workforce training programs are designed by paying careful attention to what employers need today and what they'll need tomorrow and, and in the future, and, and training is designed to uh, develop those skills, it's critical. And I continue when I visit manufacturers, I continue to hear we have vacancies. I just can't find people with these skills. So the ability to hire someone who's willing to learn those skills is critical. So I think this will continue to be an area that the federal government has to play a role in terms of providing resources for good, high quality job training programs. Ben, did you have uh, thoughts on the workforce training issue? I was gonna say something very similar to what John said and also you know, kind of uh, jumping on also what, what Congressman Cicilline said. I think the, the other important part of that as well is you know, the train, training is such a big piece of that. And, and also it, it's important to train people who are looking for those jobs, but also the continued career path of people internally who are already working within our, our manufacturing and our company, uh, being able to train them for maybe those positions that uh, they don't have the skills for yet, that will create jobs as well, because as people move up, there's, there will be vacancies that need to be filled. Um, just that, that environment of training um, and, and making sure that uh, it's training that, that, that will help perpetuate a, a continued career path and growth for employees is uh, gonna be extremely important. And anything we can do, as we talked about earlier with some of the uh, you know, investment tax structures and things like that, being able to reinvest and being able to support those training uh, programs. Um, as you know, I take what we've always been extremely passionate uh, starting, you know, my grandfather's starting it, my dad uh, building on it, um, it tremendously. Training is so important. So whatever we can do to continue to train our, our workforce, um, the more the better. Susan, your thoughts on how we can improve workforce training? Yeah, no, it's it's really great to hear that Taco's attitude toward training, and, and I think, uh, alas, it's it's rare, <laughs> and I think it's it's a potential really great area for a business government collaboration. Um, one area that I think is sometimes missing from these discussions of skill shortage is just is wages, um, and that you know you really want somebody who's going to show up on time and. Uh, you know, want to embrace learning new things. Well, you know, they need to have money to, to afford adequate transportation to uh, feel like their kids are well taken care of, etc. cetera. Um, and you're also in competition. And so I think, you know, the, the idea that, uh, you know, you can get a worker with all these skills and I think take is very different, but I, I've talked to many manufacturers that are kind of mystified about why their workers being paid $10 an hour don't have these skills that they're looking for the soft skills, they say, and I think it's sort of like, you know, expecting to find a, uh, you know, a Cadillac or a Lexus for $10,000, you know, are you, uh, do you have a worker shortage or a uh, payment shortage in that case? So, so I think that the training upgrading and then the, the wage upgrading also has to have to happen in, in, in turn. So Emily has a question. She wants to know, how can we make it easier for firms to adapt to rapid industry changes? So we know that there is a lot of transformation taking place based on COVID and just the need to protect workers and the need to uh, train them better. But then we also, at the same time, are having changes in business models. There are technological changes that are taking place. We're kind of moving to high tech and advanced uh, manufacturing. So how can we make it easier for firms to adapt to a world that's changing very rapidly right now? I, 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 I would say, you know, the sort of existing competitive model is creating incredible incentives for businesses to figure out how to respond to changes in technology and uh, innovative new materials. And I mean, I think uh, the Biden plan provides for a significant investment in research that I think the government can play an important role in facilitating the development of new technologies and new materials. And um, we're doing that in our infrastructure bill with you know, kind of new innovative materials in infrastructure. So I think we can do that, but I think part of this is also the way our, our free enterprise system works, that there's an economic incentive for people to figure it out to stay competitive and, and be a successful business. But probably Ben and John have specific ideas on that. Well, you know, interesting. That's a great point, Congressman. And I, I, I think to build on that a little bit, thinking about how do we adapt, I think in certain situations, um, I don't mean to go 
for this as an example again, but you know, looking at the work from home um, structure, that was not something we ever really um, implemented before this uh, at, at an extensive level. Um, I think kind of, um, you know, as my dad says sometimes, unlearning things, right? So it, we, we are wired a certain way that this is how we do things and this is how we're going to, to move forward. I think allowing ourselves the ability to unlearn things um, because we're wired a certain way or that we just, that's how it's always been. And, and looking at ourselves in the mirror a little bit and understanding, um, you know, in, in this example, you know, having to do it overnight essentially allowed us to learn that we were able to do it successfully uh, and also learn what, what parts of it did work, what parts of it didn't work. And I think part of that structure will work across the board in terms of looking at it from everything from work from home to technology on the floor. There are, there are it's just certain areas where um, as we adapt, it's going to take uh, not only the people who are experts in those areas, but also, uh, and John mentioned this earlier, working with uh, you know folks who are going to be doing those jobs on the floor and, and um, finding what ways work best for, because it's not going to be um, cookie cutter business to business. It, it really will be important to learn how those certain how different technologies and different business practices work uh, work well and efficiently within individual businesses and their their different uh, practices. I would, I, I guess jump in and, and say, I, I think what we need is a mix of, of kind of competition and collaboration and that um, free enterprise works well. But but if you compare sort of what a small business like Takeo does has to do in the US with a maybe similar business in Germany, uh, MIT professor Suzanne Berger talks about American firms being kind of home alone. Um, whereas in contrast, Germany, which is a you know very high wage, you know higher wage, uh, country than the US and yet has almost double the percentage of their GDP from manufacturing, how do they do it? It's because they have the government support uh, for applied R&D and the Fraunhofer Institutes that the, the Manufacturing USA is, is modeled after. So there's a, a support for applied R&D. Um, there's uh, support for long-term finance from kind of government uh, public-private partnerships. Um, there's uh, workforce training um, uh, that's uh, provided in collaboration with employers, associations, unions, and uh, government. And then there's co-determination for at least the bigger firms uh, to kind of make sure that the business is operated you know, for a variety of stakeholders, not just shareholders. And so I think these things together really help German small firms, uh, the, the Mittelstand, the, the, uh, the backbone of the German economy, they make them very competitive internationally. And so thinking about how some of those lessons apply to the US economy is something I think that, that really this pandemic has spurred and we see it in the, the plans that uh, Congressman has mentioned and the, the plans that Biden is proposing. Uh, Nicolina Womack, who works for a uh, uh, organization called Future in Design, wants to know about the cost differentials between moving jobs overseas versus uh, keeping them in the United States. And in particular, wants to know the impact of COVID on that cost differential. Is COVID and other changes that are taking place now going to increase or dis uh, decrease those uh, cost uh, differentials? Uh, and how are you thinking about that in terms of uh, future activities in this area? I, I can jump in on that because I, th I think that's a case where um, I think companies have actually made some mistakes that uh, prices in China looked so attractive. Uh, those prices have come up and then they also are accompanied by some hidden costs that company accounting systems are not well equipped to, to, uh, to calculate. So how much does it cost, you know, a miscommunication that uh, leads to the wrong product or the supplier, you know, substitutes a cheaper material and you, you weren't there on site to catch it. Um, how do you value all those hidden costs? So there's some work by uh, Harry Moser, the Resoring Institute, that, that has some calculators that, that get at some of this stuff. So I think the, the cost differentials are far smaller than they're often seem to be. And then I think, you know, that what does COVID do? I think there's two possibilities. <laughs> um, one is it makes everybody aware of the risk. Um, and so that we, you know, when you factor in the risk that you won't get any supply at all, um, then, then a local supply looks more attractive. 
Um, I think on the other hand, you know, because China has done a better job, you know, they had their pandemic early and they've done a better job of curtailing it than we have, their manufacturers are up and running. Um, they're not uh, incurring, I think, some of the slowdown and reduced capacity that you know responsible manufacturers like Takeo are seeing to keep their workers safe. So I think that it's actually a, a time that that uh, policy is is super important to, to uh, take advantage of our realization of risk and make it uh, last long term. And Congressman, I know you have uh, already talked a little bit about tax incentives uh, that basically encourage uh, companies to offshore. So I'm just wondering, how do you see the impact uh, of COVID on these cost differentials between having jobs abroad versus having them at home? And what can we do to reduce those cost differentials? Uh, I think, you know, a couple of things. One is there's actually a kind of more fundamental question about whether or not you can uh, move certainly workers from the United States to places around the world. Uh, there are existing travel restrictions right now. So there's actually just a kind of a logistical question as to whether or not you can actually move an operation, if that includes moving personnel, um, which is a whole separate challenge. Um, but I think, you know, the thing that we have to be concerned about um, is, you know, companies, I think, are, want, are going to want to ensure that they're keeping their workers safe. And to the extent that there are countries that may, this seems kind of odd coming from the United States because we have failed in very significant ways to follow the science. So it seems a little um, presumptuous to be saying this, but we certainly want as a matter of policy to be sure that uh, we're not allowing American businesses to benefit by sending an operation to a country that maybe doesn't have in place sufficient worker protections and therefore the cost to that company is less. So we have an additional uh, kind of thing that I think we have to be sensitive to in the middle of a global health pandemic. But, but I think, you know, again, the, to resort to the earlier comment, you know, the principal way that I think we have to affect the economics of moving jobs outside of the United States is through our tax code. And we ought to just intentionally design it in a way, if in fact we wanna keep and grow manufacturing jobs in the US, then we ought to be willing to use the tax code uh, to create those incentives, or at the very least, to remove the opposite incentives that encourage people to move those jobs overseas, um, because that's a that's a part of the calculation. Is what's the what's the implications for my tax liability as a business? Um, uh, but I think COVID is layering on another challenge that we just have to be very sensitive to. That there isn't some country that um, maybe has less. Um, thoughtful and responsible restrictions on worker safety, and it becomes cheaper to operate there in the middle of a global pandemic. And I just think we have to be very sensitive to that. Okay, uh, Ben or John, uh, any of your thoughts on jobs in the United States versus uh, jobs abroad? I mean, many of your jobs are located here. You do have uh, a couple of factories abroad as well. John, you want to take? Sure, I, I, I would say that we, we do have facilities, manufacturing facilities, um, several in Europe, also a, a stainless steel foundry in Vietnam, uh, and, and they're facilities that we're very, very proud of, and, and they are uh, both you know, integral support parts of our supply chain. Um, and But, but as, far, as far as taking jobs that are currently located in the United States and, and moving them you know, out, out of the States offshore somewhere, particularly right now with what's going on, I, I just don't see that being a, a viable, I'm speaking probably primarily from, from a takeo perspective, but I, I just wouldn't see that being a, a viable uh, option for several reasons. You know, number one, just the very logistics of being able to, you know, to, to find another location, travel to and from the logistics of that piece of it, finding workers um, to do the job uh, with, with travel restrictions and what's going on right now. I just don't see that being a particularly easy task. Uh, and I could, I could be incorrect, but once again, that's just my, my kind of take. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, once again, from, from a take perspective, at the very least, you know, we're, we're very, very proud that our primary product lines you know, are made in America, have always been made in America. Uh, and that's, that's part of our brand. It's, it's part of what makes Takeo Takeo. Uh, and it's part of what uh, I think creates a lot of trade loyalty, uh, you know, with the, uh, the heating uh, and cooling contracting trade uh, and with our OEM customers as well. I mean, we're, we're very, very proud to, to, to make our product in America and to support, you know, 500 families uh, here in this country. So I, I just don't think you know, any time would be a good time to do that, but especially now when people more than ever 
uh, you know, here in America are, are, are hurting uh, and, and need these jobs. And, and I, I just, I just my, my thought would be absolutely not. So. Okay, uh, we just have a few minutes uh, left. So I'll ask one uh, final question, which comes from Carol Thomas of NIST, which is the uh, National Institute of uh, Standards and uh, Technology. And this person basically notes that we regularly recognize the power grid, the electrical grid as a vital and critical infrastructure in the United States. And we devote a lot of efforts to protecting that. Carol notes that we don't bring that same mentality to the manufacturing grid. And basically wants to know if we actually should start to think of the manufacturing grid in a similar way to we think about the power grid as a vital asset and critical infrastructure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think we have known uh, for a long time, maybe people haven't articulated it often enough that having a manufacturing base is essential to our national security, to our ability to protect public health. And um, we ought to be thinking about the necessity of protecting and promoting and strengthening our manufacturing ecosystem because it is essential for the survival of our country and of our democracy. And uh, having the privilege of representing the state that was the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. I think we can speak with some authority on this, but yes, absolutely. And we ought to treat it that way. And that's why we ought to have a national manufacturing strategy and why we ought to have policies in place that actually intentionally calibrate where the gaps are and identify the gaps in our manufacturing economy and supply chains that are essential for the defense of our country and the protection of public health and well being, and make sure we're intentionally investing in uh, filling those gaps. So I think that's a great way to end this panel on a really important point. Susan, your thoughts on manufacturing as critical infrastructure? Yeah, I would agree. I think it's, uh, I think it's a great analogy. Um, I guess I think, um, you know, it's important to think about um, building our critical infrastructure in the U.S. Um, and also sort of you know, what is it that we still want to be buying from abroad, that we're not going to be 100 percent U.S. focused. But, but I think this metaphor of the grid and the interdependence and the need to, uh, you know, invest up front to prevent calamity later, um, it's a very helpful reminder. So thank you. Okay. Uh, on that note, uh, we're out of time, but I want to thank uh, Ben, John, Susan, and Congressman Cicilline. Really appreciate uh, sharing your uh, thoughts. Uh, COVID certainly has been a, a big challenge for the manufacturing uh, sector, as well as the country and the world in general. And it will be interesting to see which of the changes, which of the innovations that we've seen so far will turn out to be uh, permanent uh, features of the uh, uh, sector going forward. So uh, to our audience, uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, we appreciate your interest and thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.